there's all of this change that we can't control. Our bodies are changing like every nanosecond for me. That's very sad. But the, the thing that I really believe is that um, no matter where you are in your life, it's never ever too late to be what you might have been. And I think looking at Bowie's life, um, he's given us permission to kind of look at life in episodes. So, reinvention. You can't, you can't really say the name Bowie without people saying personas, characters, right? He changed his personas like some of us change our clothes. And again, the narratives around why he did this are so fascinating. He said, I don't know whether I create the characters or whether they create me. From my point of view, they were a channel that he chose to communicate what he needed to communicate. So, you know, we think of all of these personas. Major Tom, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Zane. And did you know that Aladdin Zane, his name is really, Alad is insane. So he had a brother that had some deep uh, problems. Um, and I really wanted to come dressed this way this morning. I couldn't pull it together. Josh wanted me to come this way. Pearson wanted me to like bolt across my face. I didn't feel this group was ready for it. <laughs> Star man, thin white duke, Thomas Jerome Benton, the man who fell from earth, and Jareth. In, in labyrinth. So he was always falling out of earth. He was always feeling as if he was an alien or from another place. And that informed his life, his art, and his music. Ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills and put your helmet on. Ground control to Major Tom. So, how many people use personas? in what they do in this room. So, many of you do, because right now, if you're involved in any kind of user experience, you're using a persona to put you more in touch with the customer experience, with the experience of people around you. And um, so, the other thing that fascinates me is this notion of how other people use personas. So I know two fabulous writers that, who are very strong in their craft, they're big thinkers, and when they work together, they actually create a third person. So it's a very, very interesting way of creating a persona. The other thing, and everyone in this room is sworn to secrecy, I have a persona named Blake Deutsch. And I quote him in my book. <laughs> I've quoted him in a number of books. I've only gotten in trouble once when a government agency called me up and said, we found this fellow so fascinating, we can't find out anything about him. <laughs> so I'm not ready yet. I'm ready for an avatar. I'm not ready yet to go public with this. So Blake Deutsch, in a way, 
has done things that I could never dream of doing. He says things that I could not find the strength to say. So, you know, looking at this notion of personas, doppelgangers, known to plume, I highly recommend it to all of you. <laughs> because at the end of the day, so I'm about to write this fifth book, and I write all about process and teams and decision making and all that, but at the end of the day, it's about having courage to go to that place where no one else will go. It's about courage. So, what I love about David Bowie is his, you know, he's a great asker of questions. He's an insatiable learner. He knows how to leave his desk and, and go into other centuries, other disciplines, other ways of thinking as a way of nourishment. And so he would say, what if, what if you mix Schoenberg with Little Richard? What if you mixed John Cage with John Coltrane? What if a little Edith Piaf with Shirley Bassey? And he would do things like, you know, it's so easy to look at his life and look at this long trail of successes, but just like all of us in this room, certainly like me, there have been times when things just come to a screaming halt. And you think there's no tomorrow, and he was very good in those kind of dark times to seize the opportunity to learn something and step away. So he hired Lindsay Kemp, who was a protege of Marcel Marceau, the famous meme artist, to teach him about movement, to teach him about makeup, to kind of leave where he was and learn something new. I think he was really inspired by P.T. Barnum and this notion of showmanship. Is there anyone in this room that has actually been to a Bowie concert? One, two, three. Is there anyone in this room that's actually met him? Oh, more on that later. <laughs> I thought, oh, I just want to get, I just want to be kind of inside of it. So I thought, well, Sigma Studios, 12th Street, that's where he taped Young Americans. I'm going to go there. I'm going to go inside the studio. Well, they sold it, and now there's just a sign. But anyway, so P.T. Barnum, he loved, he went from Kafka to Kabuki. He went from Dolly to Dietrich. His dream was to do something with Marlena Dietrich. Unfortunately, it never happened. And then he had the extraordinary opportunity to visit Warhol in the electric factory. And then years later, he actually played Warhol in a film about Basquiat. Has anyone seen that film? Yeah. Fabulous, isn't it? They haven't asked me yet to be in a film. The possibilities are almost limitless. What can we do now? So I love that. I mean, just this notion, even in the darkest days, that the possibilities are endless. You have to get up, away from your desk, away, away from this, <laughs> and, oh, I'm so happy. And, and you have to explore, because when you explore things that have nothing to do with what you're working on, is when you really, really leap. Your soul leaps, your mind leaps, you really, really leap forward. So... <coughs> 
Oh, so do you want to hear something really strange? So my brain room is kind of behind that wall there. And so I went back there, kind of sat there, and there was a bag, and it says, God loves David Bowie. <laughs> synchronicity. I love synchronicity. So make art. Or as Neil Gaiman would say, make good art. Has anyone seen that Neil Gaiman? Oh, oh. You need to see it today, later. We should watch it now. So here he is. Here he is. Notice, so he and I have this eye thing going on. It's so amazing. So when he was 14, he got, he was in a romantic spat with his best friend. They were like 14 or 15. His best friend socked him. And then he had a series of eye operations over four months. And then it's been said that his eyes are different colors. But it's not true. Actually, this eye has this pupil that never, that never did, healed. So, did anyone go to the VNA David Bowie show in London? Yes, fabulous. 1.3 million people. And I talked to someone in London recently and I said, tell me, tell me about that show. And they said, and this was a person who specializes in museums. And this person said, the big surprise to me was his sketches. And I have found out that he is a hoarder. And I am a hoarder. <laughs> My husband is nodding his head. So he was really a designer. He would draw. And actually, he studied, um, he studied graphic design when he was in high school. And I don't know how many of you know this, but he had a very short job working for J. Walter Thompson, which is just kind of wild to me. So anyway, he used sketches to kind of see the future. What should the future look like? So he used the sketches for makeup, for performance, for everything. and I. I wish that I could have seen that show. Isn't it so beautiful? And then he would also storyboard his videos. And this was Ashes to Ashes, and this is one of his sketches. So his relationship to his art was very deep and profound. He once said, um, you know, I became a musician because I could not become a painter. And he would go to his art when he couldn't solve a problem. He couldn't, like, write the lyrics or write the music. He would just, like, drop it. And he would paint and make art. He also used <coughs> art as therapy in his very dark days. So he, um, he was a drug addict. Um, you know, I grew up in the 60s. Drugs were very appealing. And, um, but, I mean, he, he went deep and over the top. And so when he moved to Berlin with Iggy Pop, part of his healing was creating art. And I think there's so much to learn about that. So this is a self-portrait, and this is a portrait that he did of Iggy Pop. So this, this is so amazing. I love this kind of synchronicity. So Jennifer Francis, could you just stand for just a minute? So Jennifer here is the director of marketing at PMA, Philadelphia Museum of Art. You can sit down. So, what year was it? 1995? 
She was David Bowie's publicist for his first ever art show. Isn't that amazing? And he gave her two pieces of art. And I said, let's bring them. And she said, I can't, they're in London. So. <laughs> but I mean, have a glass of wine with Jennifer because she can tell you some very authentic stories. I'm making everything up. So, <laughs> anyways, um, so this is actually a picture of him at that opening. And the gallery was? Uh, 27 Gold Street Gallery. Gallery at 27 Gold Street Gallery. Yes. And there were paintings and lithographs. So he used all these media. It used to be flowers. who might have been on the fringe, a lot of us who might have felt alienated, gave us permission to express ourselves. What's that? <laughs> no, okay. So, um, so this notion of um, sexuality, this notion of <coughs> what is beauty, this notion that a man can really be beautiful was a really, really kind of revolutionary thing at the time. Two years, two years, um, I think maybe it was around 72, um, Britain had just opened up homosexuality not to be a crime. And so this, you know, I have this crazy process. I've interviewed a lot of people, different ages, about what effect he had on them. And it just amazes me that people who were 21, people who were 35, people who were 45, 50, 60, he gave us permission to be an alien. He gave us permission to really express who we were in a completely different way. So. I, I could be king. And you, you could be my queen. Could drive them away. 
things within the culture, Tilda Swinton. He influenced so many musicians. You know, I could list a hundred of them. You know, U2, Gaga, Lou Reed, Luther Vandross, Iggy Pop, the list goes on and on. So, how many of you invested in Bowie Bonds? What? <laughs> None of you? Ridiculous. So, he was the first artist ever to create a financial instrument. And it was called Bowie Bonds. And so, I called up my sister-in-law, who's a banker, and I said, How, what, what effect did Bowie have on you? She goes, Bowie Bonds, you know. So this is really wild. I've forgotten this fellow's name, but I, yeah, David Pullman. So this is crazy. David Pullman went to Wharton. He created this instrument with him, and it was really what he did has affected a lot of artists in terms of royalties, intellectual property, and here's the thing that's so crazy. He lived in my building. 2601. All right. So, um, so you know, we apply our creativity in different ways, and we extend our influence in different ways. So, I think both of these fellows were actually visionaries because they didn't listen to the marketplace in so much as they listened to them. Who was that? <laughs> that was the marketplace. <laughs> that, was, that was all those data analytics people like, oh. <laughs> um, So, they both, um, first of all, he had the first, uh, uh, he created his own ISP, which is pretty phenomenal. The effect that he had on um, technology and certainly the way we listen to music was phenomenal. But these two fellows were really cut from the same cloth. So, in terms of you might be doing something so extraordinary with your life now, but it might not, you might not know it. So let some time pass and have the luxury of reflecting back. So, no one does it alone. I mean, this fellow <laughs> claims that he did it alone, but actually no one does it alone, even when you're a rock star, right? No one does it alone. 
And the people that I really admire are the ones that take time in every day to just say thank you, to express gratitude for things that sometimes people... Everyone is sworn to secrecy. 
And so we've gone from, you know, this work is so cryptic, so deep, um, so profound. So this is kind of crazy because Mozart, whom I wish I had known, um, he never finished his Requiem. He never finished it. Bowie did. I mean, for me, that is the most extraordinary thought. Oh, 